<laughs> Sergeant at Arms. Okay, ladies, thank you, kid, and gentlemen. And those that are not ladies and gentlemen, you can also sit down. I thought they were going to pass a law. And I just want to tell you right now that uh, the rumor has it that I'm taking over Jay Leno. It is exactly true. All right. So in that regard, please remember to turn off your weapons of mass distraction. And let's get ready for the contest and reintroduce the fabulous Toastmaster, Charlene Reinhardt. I became dumbfounded. 
I blew up the presentation. I knew that I had to do something to overcome my fear of speaking. I did not want to be held back in life because of my fear. So, I heard about Toastmasters from a friend of mine. I decided to check out a Toastmasters club. Notice that I only wanted to check out a club and not go to a club. <laughs> My goal was just to go and check out a club, attend a meeting, and see what it's about. So after hearing about uh, that club, I, mean, uh, I did some research online and I found the club in my area. I attended that club meeting as a guest. For the first day, after attending the meeting, for like 10 minutes, I was ready to leave. <laughs> So, at the end of all the speeches, I was getting really happy, thinking that it's now time to go home. Oh no, <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> Just getting started, the table topics. And after a few rounds of table topics, the topics master looks at me and asks me, do you want to give it a try? Oh boy, I didn't see that coming. So now, but luckily the person who sat next to me had told me that when you are a guest, you have the right to pass. So I exercised my right. <laughs> and so pass was my word for that day. I attended a few more club meetings as a guest. As you can imagine, I did more passing. Finally, I decided to join Toastmasters as a member. And the next meeting, believe it or not, the topics master calls me up again for table topics. And this time, I had lost my right to pass. <laughs> so now, I went up to the stage, the stage and I spoke something completely meaningless. I don't know what I said. For like 35 seconds, and then I went rushing back to my seat, as if I was heading for safety. So, after that experience, I felt so humiliated that I thought to myself, after this meeting is over, I am going to rush through that door and never ever show my face to these people again. <laughs> That's exactly what was going on in my mind. So after that meeting, I was really rushing to the door, but the club president wouldn't let me go. <laughs> he had a big smile on his face. I liked that, but not the other thing, the sign-up sheet in his hand. <laughs> so now, he got me signed up to give my icebreaker the following week. Now I had to go back in there at least one more time to deliver my icebreaker. So the next week went by, I prepared for my icebreaker speech. On the day of the speech, I was so nervous. I was extremely nervous that I just wanted to run out of the room. But I know I couldn't do that. So when it was, when it was my turn to give the speech, I went to the podium and I stood there like a statue. I didn't move my hands, not my head. Well, actually, I don't think I moved my eyes either. <laughs> I spoke so fast because I wanted to be done with that thing. And I think I took like three breaths for the entire duration of my speech. <laughs> you know what, though? I did it. I delivered my icebreaker and that was a big step for me. When I went back to my seat, I got all these little notes from the members of the room that had comments about my speech. So when I read through those notes, I realized that people had the nicest things to say to me. They were so nice that I couldn't throw those away, even though I knew those were not true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, still today, those are the best lies I've heard. <laughs> but I realized that people in the room were routing for me to get out of my fear. I got a lot of encouragement and because of all the encouragement, I decided that I would turn my fear into a challenge. A challenge to actually get up and speak at every opportunity that I get, no matter how much I hate it. So because of all the encouragement, I decided to stay with Toastmasters and not just check out clubs, but actually stay with Toastmasters, take on more active meeting roles. And after that, I joined the corporate club at my company. I've made progress through my speeches. And guess what? I even volunteer for table topics these days. <laughs> so, my journey through Toastmasters is actually a very small example that shows how much a few words of encouragement can mean to a person. Especially when people are trying to go after something they think they cannot accomplish. 
So fellow Toastmasters and guests, I want to challenge all of you in here today to encourage people around you. Encourage them and let them know that they are doing a great job. It might seem like a very small thing to do, but you never know what it can mean for them. Life's battles, like I said, always goes to the person who thinks he can. I used to think that I can never get up and speak in front of a room full of audience. But thanks to the encouragement that I got from Toastmasters, and those little notes of lies, <laughs> not only do I think I can, but I know I can. So little things definitely, definitely mean the most. Number two, Peter Russell. Grilling and chilling. Grilling and chilling, Peter Russell. <laughs> hamburger your friends, family, or neighbors ever had. Just like Guy Fieri on TV or Emerald. You can be that person too. Mm -hmm. That won't get you there. <coughs> but let's start at the beginning. Some people like a charcoal chimney. I prefer the pyramid method. You have your charcoal grill, pour the coals in that kettle grill down to the bottom rack. I say build the pyramid. Get it as tall as you can. Dice up with lighter, lighter fluid. Wait about 30 to 60 seconds. Then fire it up. What you will now allow is the kerosene to soak into the charcoal. So it will actually burn the charcoal and your coals will be ready in about 15 to 20 minutes. Next, let's talk about making that hamburger. The hamburger, the all-important part of the meal. The object to do is make the perfect burger. You want to take a handful of hamburger meat, tennis ball to hardball size. What that's going to give you is the perfect round burger to fit a little bit over the edge of the bun and be a half inch thick. The reason you want a half inch thick hamburger, you want a burger that's going to cook uniformly for you, especially if you have eight or ten burgers on the grill. You have this glob of hamburger in your hand, guys, pay attention. You have saran wrap out of your cooking area, your prep area. Put the hamburger right on that saran wrap and you won't make a mess. Your wife will be so impressed. <laughs> You're going to form the burger by turning it slowly, carefully. You don't have to press it too hard. You don't have to overform it. All you have to do is come up with a burger, approximately a half inch thick, and it'll be a little bit bigger than the bun. You think you're done? You're not. The next thing you want to do is take your thumb, put a little dimple right in the center of that burger, quarter to an eighth of an inch. You're going to ask me why. I'll get to that later. Now that your burgers are done, the next step, take your buns, get them out of the wrappers, assemble them on another plate. You're going to need them. 
You know the thing you're going to want to do? You're going to put cheese on your burger. Make sure your cheese is unwrapped. And ready to go. <laughs> you're also going to want to fold the corners over on your cheese. I can't find the edge of this thing, so I can't show you. Fold the corners over, and I will get to that later as well. Now you're ready to go out to the grill and check on your coals. You're going to go out to the grill, you're going to take some long tongs with you, because in 20 minutes, that pyramid of charcoal, those coals should be ashen white. You're going to want long tongs, because that charcoal should be burning between six and 700 degrees. You want to distribute those coals around evenly at the bottom of that grill rack. You want a nice even distribution of charcoal, three to four inches thick. <laughs> Women, you're not going to have to worry about this. Guys, change hands. You will have no hair on your knuckles, guys. <laughs> That's how you know that fire is ready to go. <laughs> Once your coals are evenly distributed, it's time to put the top rack on your grill. You might think now's the time you're going to throw your burgers on. No! Let that grill rack warm up. You want to take your grill brush, clean the residue off. Then you're going to take your long tongs one more time. Wad up a paper towel. Dip it in some cheap cooking oil. Better yet, some bacon grease. You're going to season that grill rack. Bacon grease. You're going to impart a little bit more flavor. You now have a great non-stick surface to put your burger on. Now you're ready. You're going to take your burger, dimple side. You're going to put it on that grill rack. First thing you should hear is a sizzle. As that meat touches that grill rack. Dimple side down. <clears throat> We're going to get to this again. Now, <clears throat> you're going to load your grill from the back to the front. What you want to do is have that grill so hot, 700 degrees, 600 degrees, you want to sear the meat of that hamburger closed. You do not want to lose any of the juices. The juices are where the flavor is. Secondly, you now have fat in this burger. That heat is rendering that fat, and that fat is oozing to the top of the burger, pushing the blood up. It's helping to cook the inside of your meat. How do you know when your burger is ready to flip? You'll look down and you'll see blood coming to the top of your burger. You know within 30 seconds of seeing that blood, it is time to flip your burger, starting at the back, flipping the burger over. It'll take one minute less to cook the second side than the first side. So if you spent three and a half minutes cooking the first side when the blood came up, be prepared to spend two and a half minutes on the second side. That means you were smart. You prepped your cheese. It's now on your burger. The reason you folded the corners in when that cheese melts, you don't want it to run off the burger. The dimple in the center of the burger, now it's the other side up. As that burger continues to cook, and those fats are rendering and boiling in the juices, it wants to make your burger expand and puff up in the center. When you put the cheese on and it starts to melt, it all wants to run off. It doesn't do anybody any good. That dimple keeps your burger nice and flat, one half inch. Now you have uniform cooking time. You want to melt the cheese and impart that last little bit of flavor. Put the lid on the grill. As that smoke comes up from the hot coals, hits the top of the grill, it's going to come back down and melt that cheese and impart that last little bit of smoky charcoal goodness. Now your burgers are done. Take them off, put them on your platter. You want to tend your platter with a little foil. You want to put your buns on, starting from the back to the front. 30 to 60 seconds, your buns should be golden and toasty. Take your buns off. Put them on another platter. Now it's ready to go. It's time to eat that burger. You're thinking, I'm the lion, I'm the pride. I get to eat first. No. <laughs> this is the time to be gracious. Let your guests eat first. In this scenario, it's great. Everybody sits down. They had your burger. You're last. You take your burger bun. You sop up all those delicious juices. <laughs> then you put your burger on your bun. You bite down into your burger. Juices down your chin and down your arm. You've created the perfect burger. Thank you.
contestant number three, Sherry Evans. Footprints on my heart. Footprints on my heart, Sherry Evans. back through the lens of your life. Have you ever wondered how it might have turned out completely different had it not been for one special person that touched your heart? It might be a parent who encouraged you to pursue your passion in order to reach your full potential. It might have been a teacher who had ignited a spark in you that brought out your creative genius. Or it might have been a coach who instilled you with unshakable confidence. Someone who changed your life for the better that holds a special place in your heart. Are you picturing him or her yet? Great. Chances are your mind scanned through more than one person. Because throughout our lives, most of us have had multiple people who have made a difference in our lives and perhaps touched our life in a profound way. For me, that special person was my grandmother Effie or as I called her, Mama, because she was more like my mother to me. The footprints she left on my heart have lasted a lifetime. Madam Contest Chair, fellow dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. Mama was short and petite, standing just five foot one in her stocking feet. This small and mighty woman was short in stature but strong as steel in her spirit. She had a strong southern accent and a sharp wit to match. She sort of looked like Granny Clampett from the TV show, The Beverly Hillbillies. Can you picture her? She was born Effie Mae Harris, February 1901 in rural Tennessee, the oldest of two daughters born to illiterate parents. Mama grew up working on the farm picking cotton, until she was 13 or 14 when she got married. By the time she was 21, she had given birth to six children, four boys and two girls. At the age of 45, she was widowed when my grandfather died and lost her youngest son in a fatal car crash. Mama experienced a lot throughout her life, and she survived most of her children. Oh, how I love my grandmother Effie. She was the embodiment of strength, love, kindness, caring, and compassion. I looked up to her my whole childhood and well into my 20s, even now. I can still remember her small, delicate hands, her smile, <coughs> the warm love that she gave me when she hugged me, her smell. Mama loved evening of Paris perfume, which I called evening of Phew! Perfume, <laughs> because it smells so strong. But it reminded me of her. I loved her more than I loved my own mother. Alcoholism was a common thread woven throughout the tapestry of my life, the fabric of our family. When I was just a little over three, living with my mother and my stepfather, my grandmother Effie, Mama, at the age of 53, came and rescued me from the threat of alcoholism that it might have ruined my life. But instead, she changed the course of my life. Because she watched as her three sons and husband were all consumed by alcoholism. Through her sheer will and strength, she was determined to break that cycle of alcoholism that had destroyed most of her family. And she didn't want that to happen to me. <clears throat> She could see the future in my home and gave me the life that I now have by taking me out of that very risky place. She knew where I might have ended up otherwise and chose wisely for me. With all of life's trials she had gone through, she unofficially adopted me and chose to lovingly raise this little red-haired, freckle-faced young boy as her own son. Mama's been gone a long time now.
She passed away in 1995. I hadn't spoken to her much the last year of her life, but as time passed and life grew short, I hoped that my grandmother Effie, Mama knew that it was her love and support that always got me through. I know how much she loved me, and I believe she knew how much I loved her. I discovered about life from having known her. The lessons I learned from her out of school were far more valuable than the ones I learned in school. There's so much to be learned by those who are older and wiser than ourselves. They've traveled the road ahead of us. They know the joys, the sorrows, the pitfalls, and the lessons we must learn. They literally are our roadmap to our tomorrows, the future, if we just take the time to view life through their eyes. As children, we can't completely comprehend, understand, or fully realize the meaning of a grandmother's love. How wise she is, how much patience she has, or how much guidance she gives us by her example, or by her helpful, caring ways. Years go by before we know and understand the depth of her concern and the love in her protectiveness. But as we mature, we do finally understand. And we can look back and we can see through older eyes and wiser hearts her unconditional love, <clears throat> devotion, and family loyalty. You see, it's these and many other things that make me realize just how blessed I am and how lucky I've been to have had this amazing, wonderful woman, my grandmother Effie Mama, as a center root of strength and love in my life. Mama always took time to enjoy her existence. She valued life and enjoyed the simple, God-given pleasures. Because you see, it's not the material possessions they leave us. For the dearly departed teach us that we can take none of them with us, but rather the indelible impressions and imprints they leave on our lives. The footprints that imprint and touch our hearts forever. Ask yourself, what footprints has someone left on your life, and what footprints will you leave on someone else's? Madam Contest Chair.
His hands were folded like a little child. Grandpa served one term in the Missouri State Senate. His term started in 1919, which was the same year that Congress passed the 18th Amendment. This amendment made alcohol illegal in the United States. The state of Missouri had to decide whether or not they would ratify that amendment. And Grandpa was undecided how he felt about the issue. He was undecided until he was approached by someone from the liquor lobby who offered him a bribe if he would vote against the amendment. That decided it for Grandpa. He was so insulted that someone would offer him a bribe that he immediately decided to vote in favor of the amendment. After all, Grandpa felt that it's what's inside that counted. This character and courage of conviction was passed on to his second daughter, who was my mom. My mom was the main cog in our family wheel. We didn't have a lot of money, so she was a very creative homemaker. Why, she could take one of those little cans of tuna fish, stretch it to feed her whole family of eight. Tuna a la mama, we called it. <laughs> she could work miracles on her little singer sewing machine. My mom's only fault surfaced on Sunday morning going to church. We were usually late, and she would insist on going all the way to the front pew. There's no way to do that discreetly. Mom followed by six kids all the way to the front. I wanted to die every time. I now know that it was probably the only time all week long that she got to sit down. <laughs> My mom could not have done what she did without her inspiration, her sweetheart, my dad. Daddy was an easygoing guy, also a man of principle. His main jobs were to go to work and to drive us around wherever we needed to go. There's a saying that if a father wants to give his children a gift, he should love their mother. Actually, that's a gift they both gave us. Their devotion to each other was always demonstrated. I can remember Daddy once saying, I don't need sugar in my coffee. I get all the sugar I need from Mama. <laughs> He also said that we were rich in love, which we were. We lived in a small, modest, white frame house. If you looked in the front picture window, you could pretty much see the whole house. Peering in, you'd see the living room, kitchen, to the right, small hall, three bedrooms, a single bath. They were organized enough to have three boys and three girls, so we all fit. <laughs> When I was about 10, the phone rang very early one Saturday morning. I knew from my mom's response that something terrible had happened. My dad had been in a head-on collision. He had 52 fractures, including both of his legs and both of his hips. My daddy had to be in traction for a long time in a hospital bed in our home, and he was out of work for over a year. My mom then had to do it all, but she still had her inspiration. The greatest miracle she worked was that we children didn't know how bad everything was because she continued to make sure that we had what we needed. We all grew up a little bit faster that year, but we got through it by sticking together and by looking for the fun and laughter where we, could where we could find it. We got a good dose of laughter when the nuns came to visit my dad one day. We tried to make the house look really nice for the sisters, but the living room was a problem because we had a broken chair in it that was a real eyesore. We were a pretty creative bunch, so we took that broken leg and we propped up that chair and you couldn't even tell it was broken. <laughs> In came the sisters, there were two of them. Wouldn't you know, Sister Mary Charles, the principal of my elementary school, went right for the broken chair. 
two leg to steer her in another direction, down the chair went with the good sister in tow. <laughs> sister Mary Charles, the principal of my school, the strictest teacher I've ever had in my whole life, was flattened in my living room. <laughs> I know, for Sister Mary Charles, that was not her finest hour, but for us kids, it was the best thing that could have happened. <laughs> Today, I'm grateful for these gifts from my grandpa, my mom, and my dad. Grandpa taught me that character and integrity cannot be bought nor sold. Mom showed me how to be strong and to focus on what's important. From Daddy, I got a positive attitude. <clears throat> and from them all, I got a sense of the power of love. I know with these gifts, I can do anything. After all, it's what's inside that counts. Then Contestant number five, Ellen Schnur, Minnesota Nice, Minnesota Nice, Ellen Schnur. We always knew Christmas was right around the corner when my grandmother began to prepare the ludicrous. She'd take that big hunk of fish, soak it in water for a week, she'd pull it out, scrub off all the slime and the dirt, and then she'd soak it for another week in lye. That's L Y E, lye. Basically, it turned the ludicrous into fish jelly. Yum. <laughs> but my grandparents, they loved their ludicrous. So, being the Minnesota nice family we were, born and raised, we always ate some. Then my husband got a promotion, and we moved to his hometown of Chicago. We joined their family dinners. Not so nice. They interrupt each other, they yell, they talk over each other. And whenever I wanted to participate, they would just drown me out. I started to dread those family dinners. Until, Madam Contest Chair, Honored Dignitaries, Fellow Toastmasters, I recently completed the uh, improvisation program at Second City. Me and a lot, bunch of 20-something males who want to be on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I love improvisation, and I've never laughed so much in my life. What I really like about improvisation is some of the tenets of it, the rules. One in particular is called Yes And. That's Yes, A-N-D. You might have heard of it, but what it means is when you enter into a scene with your fellow improvisers, you don't 
think about how stupid it is, or ridiculous, or dumb. You don't try to change that scene or make it different. You <coughs> embrace it. You say yes to it. You treat it as a gift. And you become part of it. You help make it better. I'll guarantee you, if you've seen a really good improvisation scene, those improvisers were yes-ending the heck out of each other. And they were probably having more fun than you were. <clears throat> I was so intrigued with yes-and that I started carrying it into my personal life. There I was, another not-so-nice dinner. And there they were, interrupting and yelling. But it was a really interesting conversation, and I wanted to participate. So I tried again. And I was drowned out. I thought, I wonder if I can yes and this conversation, this not so nice dinner. Can I embrace it and, and not try and change it and become one of them? So I started talking really loud. And of course, they were startled because it was me. <laughs> but I kept talking really loud. And pretty soon, I was part of that conversation. <laughs>
Contestant number six, Liz Kisner, my challenging child, my challenging child, Liz Kisner. five times over, from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed. He never stopped. He was like the ever-ready bunny. Instead of having a nine volt, he had a rocket booster. <laughs> he never stopped. Whether you have ADD or not, navigating through life can be challenging, can it? Madam Contest Chair, fellow dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, how do we navigate? Educate. Educate to understand that what you see is not always what you get. I had an old neighbor who was an RN. She would not let my son play with her son because he would catch it. Dear Lord, I thought, what, what are you going to catch? You cannot catch ADD. ADD is hereditary. Yeah. <laughs> ADD is neurological. It just means that our brains are wired differently. For example, a non-ADD person, here's their pathway. Ooh. Pathway of an ADD person. Ooh. <laughs> it's neither good, bad, or indifferent. It's just the way we are. When we talk about ADD, what can we do about it? We can navigate with humor. One night we smelled smoke. I, I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. I called 911. I said, please, no sirens, no lights. Ma'am, we cannot do that. <laughs> Within two minutes, we had the whole rescue team in our house. Firemen, policemen, EMT, as well as some nosy neighbors. 
<laughs> Nathan, wearing only his Batman underwear, oh boy, was he in his glory. He was running around the first floor as if he were a NASCAR racer. Fireman, EMT. I was really worried. I couldn't find the smoke, I couldn't find the fire. The firemen couldn't find the smoke or the fire, which really alarmed me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when it dawned on me. I was really worried to the point that Nathan was just so obnoxious with hyperness. It's, it's as if he drank a 32 ounce can of Monster. The kid wouldn't settle down. I thought, oh my gosh, earlier that evening, he was adamant that he was going to wear his Batman underwear. Batman, 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 Batman. I thought as a parent, okay, we're going to choose our battles. Batman it is. He took his Arthur underwear and flung it on the halogen lamp. That's right, Arthur was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> when we deal with people that have challenges, it's okay to be different. Different's okay. Each and every one of us in this room is different. Isn't that what makes the world a beautiful place? Couldn't we use more compassion? <coughs> Empathy, intolerance. Life is always full of challenges, whether you have ADD or not. It's what you do with those challenges that makes a difference. Every single one of us in life will navigate through challenges, whether it's today, Tomorrow, next year, do not, do not let those challenges define who you are. Man of Contest Challenge.
Madam Toastmaster, the ballots have been collected.
master's educational level. I just completed my icebreaker speech last month. <laughs>
seconds for not multitasking and for being a contestant in the table topic contest. Weber or Brinkman, 
and drive in the John Madden bus and go to all kinds of sporting events <laughs> and cook food you wouldn't normally get on a grill. To show how versatile they are. Well, you are being recorded now, so hopefully one of those grillers will contact you again. <laughs> seconds to get your message out to the world. So think about every time you get into a contest, you have 450 seconds or 7 minutes and 30 seconds to share each and every one of your message. And so that's really a challenge to do that because if we had 45 minutes to say everything we wanted to say, that'd be fantastic. But it's 450 seconds really to, to deliver a powerful message.
uh, within our own club mentor uh, more people or be a coach in some regard. I think that we can always give back in some capacity as even area governor. <laughs>
place Table Topics Contest winner. The third place Table Topics Contest winner from Northwest Division is Marcus Rumbers. <laughs> Mother, 
Barry Mixon. Hey! <laughs> Toastmasters, and also Toastmasters from Toastmasters on Purpose. Thank you for su your support, and I look forward to going to the district. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this contest is concluded. However, there is still hope for the food. Let's enjoy it for a few more minutes.